thank you, uh, Chauhan sir. So, uh, for Venkateshwara Hospital and the two eminent speakers, I was telling them that this is the most uh, academically intellectual oriented group that I have seen in India. Planning to call this in Asia also and world also, but for that I have to attend the other Asia and the world. But in India, I can tell you that it's an honor to be part of it. Uh, with that, uh, I think let's start our CME today. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Kuldeep Sharma. Uh, Dr. Kuldeep Sharma is an eminent radiation oncologist. Actually, ye sab bolo jana, ek Delhi mein maine sikha hai. If you are Mansonian, your introduction ends there. It is so famous, I didn't know that. But you know, still, I am supposed to say, so he has more than 20 years of experience in radiation oncology field. He has special interest in modern radiotherapy techniques, including IMRT, IGRT, VMAT, SRS and SBRT. And I am sure he will be speaking about these. He is a dynamic oncologist who is well updated with the recent developments in this field. He has been previously associated with leading hospitals like Ames, Rajiv Gandhi, Medanta and Artemis Hospital. Apart from presenting papers at various international conferences, he has written multiple book chapters and research papers in national and international journals. He received Healthcare Excellent Awards for the Best Radiation Oncologist of the Year 2012 and 2014. <laughs> he is a Commonwealth scholar and winner of multiple international grants and awards. In the past, as I said, he was senior consultant in Artemis and consultant in Medanta in the field of radiation oncology. Uh, sir, by the time you reach the dais, uh, so just uh, today. We have two speakers, uh, one is uh, in radiation oncology, one in surgical oncology. So radiation, surgical and medical oncology are the three pillars of cancer treatment. I think radiation and surgical oncologists are, they deliver the local treatment and medical oncologists deliver the systemic treatment. There is a big difference. But one of the most important aspect about radiation which many people don't know, is it's an absolutely non-invasive in 90% of the patients. There are some invasive radiation also. And the local treatment cures solid tumors. Please remember, local treatment cures solid tumors. And Dr. Kuldeep is a part of one of that uh, team which cures cancers in your patient. Over to Dr. Kuldeep. Thank you, sir, for the nice introduction. And uh, without much ado, I will just start the lecture. I'm Dr. Kuldeep Sharma, and uh, I'm a radiation oncologist associated with Venkateshwar Hospital since its inception in 2016. And uh, till today, we have expanded our work there. Now we have two senior accelerators there, one brachytherapy unit, and other comprehensive oncology divisions and departments. So we all know that cancer is the second leading cause of death worldwide and the number of cancer deaths and number of cancer incidences are increasing day by day. You must have also noticed that these days we are coming up with so many news that one of our friends or neighbors or celebrity they get this disease. But at the same time, the good part is that, that most of these patients are getting cured also. Very so good. cancer is not now a death sentence. So this you can rest assure your people, your friends, your patients, that if they have got this diagnosis, then it is not the end of the road. There are very good treatments available, very successful treatments are available these days, some of which are the discussed. So when we talk about the treatment modalities for cancer, we know that one is the surgical oncology, that is the most oldest form and most time-tested treatment. Dr. Saurabh Gupta will tell about this in the next lecture. Next is chemotherapy, which is done by medical oncology department. Dr. Vora is an expert for that, you already know him. And 
Then the latest branch is the radiotherapy or radiation oncology, which along with chemotherapy or along with surgery is used as the local treatment for cancer. So radiotherapy or radiation oncology or radiation therapy, we call it by three names. It is a, that speciality that uses various different form of radiations like gamma rays, electrons, x-rays, protons, neutrons. So we, 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 we use all these type of rays in different forms, in different doses to treat diseases, mostly cancers, but in certain cases, even the benign diseases, the non-cancerous diseases are also treated with radiation. And when we say radiation, generally we have two types of radiation. One is the external beam radiotherapy, which means that the radiation is delivered from a linear accelerator, which is a machine, and it is delivered from outside the body. It is completely a non-invasive treatment. The patient lies uh, on a couch. Uh, patient lies down on a couch and uh, then without touching him, we deliver radiation to the part of the body which has two. Another part or another form of radiation is radiotherapy, which I tell uh, in the next slide. So this is the workflow of uh, radiation uh, delivery. Uh, the first picture. So this is the first picture. Uh, so the first day when patient comes to us, we make a patient position and we use this sort of uh, uh, a mask where. So we use this sort of mask so that patient do not move. Because these days radiation delivery is very very precise. So if our patient moves a bit, then the complete target will be missed. So we make this type of mask, then we do a planning CT scan with this mask. And then on the CT scan, we mark the areas where we want to give radiation and the areas where we do not want to give radiation. For example, if you are seeing this head and neck case, so this is the tumor, red color. So I want to give radiation here, but at the same time, I want to save the spinal cord, the mandible, the parotid. So I specify those organs where I have to save, which I have to save from radiation and those areas where I have to deliver radiation. This is the most important part of a work of a radiation oncologist in modern radiation <coughs> oncology. And then my physics team, they plan radiation in such a way that my targets or my doses are achieved in the most uh, successful or in the most efficient way. So once a required plan is ready, then that plan is delivered to the patient. So this, uh, this uh, whole process is called radiation planning and it takes generally two to three days and after that patient comes to us on daily basis, OPD basis and he gets treated. So as I said, the another form of uh, radiation delivery is by brachytherapy. In brachytherapy, we deliver a radiation source, there is a small source which is uh, of the size of a small rice grain and uh, that source remains inside this machine which is called brachytherapy machine and so that source is actually a live radiation uh, source and it is like an atom bomb or nuclear bomb. So it has to be kept in a very safe custody and when a patient comes to us, we uh, with the help of these tubes, we connect uh, this machine to the patient's body. For example, this is a breast. So we uh, put some needles inside the breast and we connect this machine with the help of these tubes to this breast. So the radiation source moves from moves out from this machine and goes to the breast area, delivers the designated dose there, and once that dose is delivered, the source goes back to its safe position. 
So that is called brachial therapy. It is a bit invasive procedure, and uh, fish, but it is done in the air. So uh, then, when we say external gene radiation, uh, we have uh, moved quite far in last 20, 30 years. Initially, uh, around 30 years back, we used to just deliver radiation by anatomy, anatomical knowledge, because there were no CT scans used, there was no MRI used. So we used to give radiation just by marking based on the anatomical landmarks. That was quite a gross form of radiation delivery. But these days, we do CT scans, we do uh, PET scan, we do MRIs, and we uh, then uh, take all the information from these images, and then we can precisely deliver radiation only to the part of the body where tumor is there. And other parts of the body do not receive any significant dose of radiation. For example, you can see here, this is a prostate case and you can see that this prostate area is getting a lot of radiation which is shown in red color but the other part of the body, rectum, urinary bladder, bones, they are not getting much dose. So the side effects are less serious. Then these days we have image guided radiotherapy on in this while just before delivering the radiation we can do CT scan daily because our linear accelerator which is delivering the radiation it can do CT scan also. So when the patient is lying down on the couch we take CT scan and we match the CT scan with the baseline CT scan and then our system, our computerized system tells us if there is any movement in the patient. Suppose patient is lying down 2 millimeter left or right, then our system will tell us that stop, your patient is not lying correctly, you move your patient by 2 millimeter, and once that correction is done, then only the radiation is delivered, otherwise system stops us from doing radiation. So this is called IGRT or image guided radiotherapy. Another form these days is the stereotactic radiotherapy, which means that we can deliver the whole radiation. If we are used to deliver in six weeks or 30 sessions, we can deliver that whole radiation dose in a single session, and the effect is like a surgeon. So whatever a surgeon is doing with his knife, we are doing the same thing with our computer mouse. So the patient comes to us in the morning, he gets radiation in one hour and he goes back home and after three months when you do the scan or after six months when you do the scan, you see that tumor is regressing in size. Because the ultimate effect is like surgery, so it is called stereotactic radio surgery. So the radiotherapy has evolved and it is one of the best time that radiation oncology is enjoying these days where we are able to deliver very very precise radiation. So radiotherapy, why it should be given? It is because it is very effective modality, it can preserve organ function, there is no need to cut organs, there is no need to remove organs. It can take care of the local and regional disease at the same time. A surgeon can do surgery only to a limited part of the body, but radiation can be delivered to bigger regions. So it can take care of a larger part of the body and it can remove the microscopic disease with which a surgeon otherwise cannot see and remove. Very it is non-invasive, it is generally an OPD uh, procedure and the side effects of modern radiation has reduced significantly. And radiation for whom? Uh, so there are basic, uh, certain basic indications where radiation has to be given. Mostly the uh, radiation is given to those patients who present to us with an early disease. And then, uh, then it is offered to them that they can go for surgery also or they can go for radiation also. But if the surgery is mutilating or the patient is not fit or the patient's choice is not surgery, then Radiation is uh, the next best or the uh, next alternative. For example, you can see in this picture there was a CA oropharynx, small disease, localized disease, and this patient surgery could have been done, but the surgery would have been very, very mutilating and big surgery. So we treated this patient several years back and 
video this session. And you can see the post in detail where this is going. This session is still lying here. Sometimes patients come to us uh, with a very extensive disease. We know that surgery is a main treatment. But when Dr. Saurabh or any other surgeon look at the patient, they feel that if we do surgery today, then surgery will be very extensive and difficult. So we give radiation before surgery. And by doing that, we shrink the tumor, make it better operable, make it small in size. And after completing radiation, patient goes back to the surgeon and then surgeon performs the surgery. So in this scenario, it is called neoadjuvant radiotherapy. Sometimes surgery is the first choice, but patients are not medically fit. So in that case, surgery, uh, uh, in the uh, place of surgery, radiation is given. For example, localized prostate, prostate localized, uh, or advanced pancreas, semi lung, etc. Uh, sometimes uh, patients undergo surgery, patient has already gone surgery, but then a surgeon look at the histopathology report, he finds out that if we keep this patient like that, then the tumor may recur because there are certain bad features of the tumor. For example, if it is a high grade tumor, advanced disease, margins are close or margins are positive, or there is lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, extranodal extension. So, if these factors or a combination of these factors are present, and in these scenarios, the surgeon himself sends these patients to us so that we can give post operative or adjuvant radiation and we can increase the surety that the disease will be cured. So, in that case, it is called adjuvant radiation. Means it is radiation is being given after the radical surgery. Sometimes uh, patients come to us with a very, very advanced disease. Patient is not fit for chemo, patient is not fit for surgery, patient has bleeding tumors. So, in those scenarios, we consider patients for palliative radiation, which means that we are not going to cure this patient, but we can shrink the tumor, we can reduce the pain, we can reduce the bleeding, and we can improve the quality of life of that patient by giving short course radiation just over one or two weeks. So, in this scenario, it is called palliative radiation. Sometimes, the patient is given as emergency treatment. For example, patient comes with a sword compression or superior vena cava syndrome or bleeding. Uh, so, in that case, those cases, radiation has to be delivered on urgent basis and patient can achieve the desired goals. As I mentioned earlier, there are certain conditions which are benign, which are not cancerous otherwise, but radiation can be used in these scenarios. One of the common is acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannomas. These are tumors which lie in the brain at a very, very difficult uh, uh, location. So surgery is often contraindicated or patients do not accept the risk. So uh, uh, we can deliver uh, stereotactic radio surgery. Graves of autopathy, keloids, these are certain other benign conditions where we routine the radiation as a part of treatment. Then, uh, sometimes we give radiation intraoperative. This patient is on the table, surgeon has removed uh, the tumor, and while the abdomen is open, we take our linear accelerator to the, uh, to the OT, or we take the patient to our linear accelerator room and we deliver radiation at that time. Although this is a very, very demanding and uh, cumbersome procedure, but yes, it is now available. So, uh, this is a good part, but one unfortunate part of radiation oncology is that there is a huge gap of knowledge towards this branch. Most of us must have read ophthalmology, EMT, everything in our MBBS curriculum, but we are never exposed to radiation oncology. So many times the physicians, they are very skeptical about my branch and they are not sure that whether a patient will achieve any benefit by uh, going through radiation or they feel sometimes that there are a lot of side effects. So this branch generally remains underutilized and this is not a part of India only, this scenario is worldwide. Many studies have been done. When I started my work in uh, Venkateshwar Hospital, I did a small study 
where I asked all the physicians who are non-oncology physicians that uh, uh, do you have uh, any knowledge about the location of this department. Around half of the hospital doctors, they were not knowing where the Asian Oncology Department is situated within the premises. And when it was asked that have you ever visited the department personally, 57% said no, because they feel, they felt, they thought that going there itself will expose them to radiation. Although this is not at all uh, a truth, this is a completely a myth. When they were asked about the facilities are available, our own uh, doctors, they were only 25% of them were aware about the facilities. So these are certain uh, myths and certain underutilization uh, scenarios where, uh, because of which this grant still remains underutilized. So generally, patients come to us for radiation, as I said, yeah, just two minutes. So in majority of cases, uh, radiation is delivered on OPD basis, Monday to Friday, five days a week. And generally, patients require 25 to 30 sessions. So our patient's radiation is generally complete within five to six weeks. And each radiation session requires around 10 to 15 minutes on the couch. So to conclude, modern radiotherapy is a very, very safe and effective form of cancer care. It is the most cost-effective modality, and thus it should be a part of comprehensive cancer care programs. There is a need to increase awareness regarding our existing oncology facilities in the country so that we can optimize the, the resources and their use. And a global effort is necessary to prepare the doctors of the new millennium for the future challenges in oncology and cancer management. With that, I end my lecture. And I give the best group of the picture where all the contestants uh, you see on the background all our cancer survivors. So, on board the box. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Majority are female, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kuldeep. Uh, I think we'll take the question answers at the end. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and he, as he promised, he took only 17 minutes for his lecture. Very good. Three minutes less. <laughs> Please come, sir. We'll have questions in the end. Now, it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, second speaker, Dr. Saurabh Gupta. Uh, he is oncosurgeon. Uh, before I introduce his qualification and experience, I remember once in Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, every Thursday morning we had grand rounds and there was a talk of advances in breast cancer medical oncology, immunotherapy, target therapy, chemotherapy and I was supposed to debate on something but the first thing which I stood on the stage and even today I tell all my patients for example, not a single breast cancer can be cured without surgery. And that speaks the volume about the oncosurgeon and there are many such solid tumors where without oncosurgery, we are just the glamorous uh, side parts of it, that's all. So with that, uh, Dr. Saurabh Gupta has done his MCH, Surgical Oncology from Adyar Cancer Institute, Chennai. Uh, he has been associated with, he had been associated with Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Max Hospital. He has a special interest in head and neck oncosurgery and for which he has trained himself in robotic surgery for head and neck cancer at Yunsai University, Severance Hospital, Seoul, Korea. And he has experience of more than 15 years in the surgical oncology field, uh, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, the stage is yours. Good evening. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind introduction. I am really honored to be here and I am thankful for the forum for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. So, without wasting much time, uh, for a surgeon to present some advances in surgical branch to most of the physicians in the challenge. So, I will try my best to just give a small overview of what uh, are the new changes in the surgical oncology. So I'll start with the role of surgery in oncology and then little bit of advances. So initially, uh, uh, X-rays and ultrasounds were the most common diagnostic modalities. Now with super specialties coming up, so CT, MRIs and even PET are very commonly done these days. 
not only pet, there is an FDG pet, Glutanog pet, PSHF pet. So different type of pet scans are there for specific diseases. Uh, therapeutic in the past, surgery or radiation, nowadays combined modality treatment, as Dr. Kuldeep already mentioned, radiation, different types of radiation, intraoperative radiation. So uh, 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 collaboration between different modalities will give a best outcome, for, especially for cancer patients. And uh, surgical techniques, then definitely I will be talking about this, that we have changed from mutilating surgeries, the scars have become smaller and the aim has shifted in addition to the oncological outcome to uh, better quality of life, better rehabilitation and cosmetics also. So uh, surgical oncology is a complex branch which demands expertise in various disciplines and exposure to many allied specialities. And, uh, Emphasis on combined modality approach, definitely the aim is organ preservation, the reconstructive techniques have become better and quality of life is a major outcome uh, So, the role of surgery in oncology, these are the different uh, heads that surgery can be done as a preventive uh, surgery also in cases of uh, some pre-malignant conditions in colon, polyposis coli, men's syndromes. Uh, as a diagnostic modality, then uh, in cases of metastatic tumors, metastatectomies, treatment, basically the treatment of uh, cancer patients in primary surgery, then they might have some residual disease uh, in recurrent settings. Emergency cancer surgeries, palliative surgeries, reconstruction and rehabilitation. So quickly, the surgeries that can prevent cancer most commonly are the uh, orchiopexy is done if there is a cryptorganism that can cause uh, predisposition to testicular cancer. Then colectomy can be done in polyposis coli, family and colon cancers, ulcerative colitis to prevent the onset of colon cancers. Men's syndromes, medullary thyroid cancers to be thyroidectomy as prophylactic in children also. And then family of breast and ovarian cancers. Uh, in ovarian syndromes, we do mastectomy and oophorectomy as a preventive surgery. For diagnosis, definitely a surgeon should have a good knowledge of what type of biopsy is required from which side. Sometimes the tissue is not representative, the report comes as inconclusive or a non oncological report and the patient is falsely reassured that cancer is not. So diagnosis and then for staging, definitely in cases of pseudomyxoma peritoni or ovarian cancer, surgery is usually done as a therapeutic measure and as a uh, staging modality also. Treatment, uh, consideration of surgery depends upon the disease related factors, patient's general condition and, uh, and also the patient's expectation, his psychological makeup, what type of surgery, what are the expectations. Different types of surgeries are there starting from local resection to wide resections to end block lymphatic resection and also multi-organ resections also. So, Oncosurgeons are always very finicky about margins. That, that's what makes us stand apart. So, uh, a complete normal rib of tissue should be taken all around the tumor. Usually, the tumor should not be seen during the surgery. Uh, if there is some doubt about the margins, we very commonly use frozen sections as a, as a modality to assess the margins in cases of doubt. Complete removal of the involved regional lymph nodes is absolutely necessary. And if required, resection of involved adjacent organs and end block resection of biopsy tracts and tumor sciences. Uh, this point is more relevant in uh, osteosarcomas, bony tumors. So, uh, the role of surgery in the treatment definitely, the surgical treatment is sometimes definitive treatment, as uh, Sir just mentioned. And sometimes the surgery is done to reduce the bulk of the disease. Sometimes uh, surgical resections of metastatic diseases are done with curative intent like pulmonary metastatic means in cases of osteosarcomas or even in colon cancer. And some oncological emergencies. Rescue disease as I just mentioned that bulky disease, if the, bulk, the load of the disease is reduced, then the systemic treatment works better and chemotherapy will be more useful. Metastatic diseases like bony sarcomas, we do pulmonary metastatectomy sometimes. In colon cancers, pulmonary metastatectomies and hepatic metastatectomy also. 
oncological emergencies, though they are rare, but still some yeah. executing hemorrhage, tumorcide bleeding is there, so we need to ligate the uh, carotids or the uh, feeding vessels, uh, perforation, some abscesses and impending destruction of adjacent organs. Palliative surgeons like intestinal obstruction ke cases may be do uh, immediate uh, colostomies and removal of mass which can cause pain. So coming to the uh, advances, uh, step uh, organ wise I start with head and neck surgery as this is close to my heart. So in the past head neck surgery was a domain of ENT surgeons but now it is a highly developed branch even after surgical oncology uh, I have trained myself in head and neck surgery and along with a good plastic surgeon and radiation oncologist which is another pillar of treatment in head and neck cancers we are able to achieve good results. So, uh, oral cancers are the commonest cancers in men in India. 80% of the time it is due to tobacco chewing and smoking, and it includes the cancers in the oral cavity, larynx, and pharynx. So, uh, the advancements, if I talk in surgical techniques, we have come in the neck dissection, we have evolved from the radical neck dissections to modified radical neck dissections to super selective neck dissections, wherein initially all the levels of lymph nodes are removed with sternomastoid vagus now sometimes uh, uh, spinal accessory now. So now we can preserve these structures and selectively remove the sites, uh, the stations of the nodes which are most likely to be involved. In uh, mandibular preservation, marginal mandibulectomy uh, is a great tool where if the bone is not involved, we can do a vertical marginal mandibulectomy, a horizontal marginal mandibulectomy. We can just remove the lingual plate or the buccal plate of mandible to save the mandible which, give, which will give a better contour of the face. Reconstructive surgery is a microvascular free flaps. This is an important event in head and neck surgeries where the different types of free flaps have come into work which gives a better cost message and function. So head and neck surgery is a branch where uh, cost message and function both play a very important role in addition to the oncological outcome. So with, with this uh, uh, microvascular free flaps, the cost message and function have improved uh, to a lot. Radiation techniques already being discussed it has uh, the morbidity of radiation is significantly reduced nowadays. Quality of life and the function aesthetics again same points. Molecular biology, genetics in head and neck also uh, though this is less developed in head and neck as compared to other lung cancers and prostate. But yes definitely we have some markers through which the longevity can be improved. So, it is very rare to find such patients these days where the central arch section was done and the bone was not reconstructed, this was just a soft tissue reconstruction. So, this is called an endicum deformity. So, I have never seen such patients recently, this is a textbook picture. So, with, with the advent of free flaps, free fibula flaps, the mandible can be reconstructed and give a, a normal appearance to the patient. In cases of larynx, also CL larynx, total laryngectomies are very few these days. Even, even in, uh, in a tertiary center, we rarely do a laryngectomy every month. So it is, the, the numbers are very less. Most of the patients of CL larynx, they are treated by chemo radiation or if surgery is required, conservative laryngeal surgeries. So the aim is to preserve the function, aesthetics and definitely function and quality of life by restoring the speech. For thyroid and parotids, we have better genetic understanding of pedulary thyroid cancer now. The technique of thyroidectomy is the thyroidectomy is one surgery where there are so much so many approaches we can do a thyroidectomy through an intraoral approach, we can do thyroidectomy through retroauricular approach, through trans axillary approaches. So endoscopic or uh, remote excess thyroidectomies are the latest in trend where we can avoid the scar in the neck and approach the thyroid to different areas. Neck dissections, as I said, have undergone uh, vast changes. So, with the PET scan and other nuclear medicine facilities, adjuvant support is good. In parotid, uh, this one thing I have learned from Korea. This is the routine incision that is that were taught to us in MS and even in MCH, a modified S incision. But this is a modified face lift incision, which is a retroauricular incision, which heals very well. It gives a good exposure, all the facial nerves are seen properly and look how beautifully the scar has healed. So for a parotid tumor, which is a, even a malignancy or a non-malignant parotid tumor, cost message is, is an important. This patient was a 
chartered accountant. He is a chartered accountant, and he stopped his practice because of this large corrupted tumor. Somebody told him that face teda ho jayega surgery karayenge. So, so finally, when I convinced him for surgery, I did the surgery through similar incision, and this is his post operative outcome. So he was very thankful. He started his practice again after the surgery. So as I told the thyroid surgery, there are different approaches of thyroid surgery. This is through the transaxillary and trans uh, breast approach. We can create a subcutaneous tunnel and go to the neck and remove the thyroid through different approaches, uh, thereby preventing the scar. Robotic surgeries are the latest in trend in, in, in surgical oncology also. So this was one patient where we did a robotic neck dissection. She had a, a C8 tongue. First stage cancer, so tongue was dealt with by intraoral approach, and neck dissection was done through this incision. Like this, we we put an incision behind the ear, put our retractors, and we lock the instruments and go in through this intraoral approach and remove the neck first. Right. So she is still disease free after more than six, seven years. Sorry. So, yes, sir. Can I request the audience to be quiet, please? There's a lot of noise in the background. Not fair for the speaker. Please request everyone to be quiet. So, uh, just to show some pictures, I try, I try to avoid showing some pictures, but the surgeon within me didn't let me do this. So, this was the largest surgery cancer I've ever operated. So, this was the final outcome after the surgery and the radiation. I don't want to show the intraoperative and other pictures, but pre and post pictures. This is some maxillectomies that we routinely do and this is how the post-operative outcomes are there nowadays with good, good plastic surgery and reconstructions. Another such tumors are the bread and butter. We very frequently see these patients and this patient was turned down by many hospitals saying you are inoperable but uh, his PET scan was non-metastatic and we could operate him. It's been <coughs> six years. He was operated in 2017. He is still disease free and uh, doing well. Another patient, this is the post-operative outcome, this is the reconstructed tongue, you can see this is the skin which is being used to make the tongue. So, you will be surprised if I show you that this was his specimen. Most of the tongue along with the entire margin of mandible was removed and this was removed by a single neck incision without putting any incision on the face. This is the post-operative picture. So, again this was operated in 2017, he is still disease free. Another, another uh, advancement in genetic surgery is dental rehabilitation. We can put, we are, we, we are doing a marginal mandibulectomy, we can put intraoperative dental implants so that after the radiation, the patient can have dental rehabilitation and uh, definitely he will have a better smile with the teeth and a good occlusion and good uh, chewing. So coming on to lung cancers, surgery for lung, early lung cancers has uh, improved a lot initially open surgical procedures were done now bats and robotics are in in, in, uh, in work. robotics very uh, it gives us a very good uh, uh, 3d vision magnification blood loss is minimal and yes the surgeries have become more safer with this minimally in invasive approaches with other techniques like endoscopic ultrasound biopsy and endobronchial ultrasound and transbronchial little aspiration so the mediastinal staging has become very easy now. We don't need to go into the mediastinum and stage those nodes which are positive on PET. So if a PET scan shows no nodes, no positive nodes, nothing to do if PET scan shows some suspicious nodes, we have these minimally invasive techniques to stage the mediastinum and prove that patient is early or a advanced uh, lung cancer patient. Again, Dr. Vora will uh, emphasize on this mainly that TTIs and immunotherapy have significantly improved the survival in lung cancer patients, specifically in metastatic setting where from one year versus for five years now. Esophagus and uh, this is a specimen of an esophagectomy and the liver, both like this. Uh, initially, something in the liver was a death sentence that disease has spread and nothing can be done. But with aggressive surgical techniques, even liver transplant, uh, transplant being done frequently, minimally invasive techniques like uh, radio frequency ablation, the, the outcomes have improved much better. Like this is a uh, liver resection specimen, this is a liver metastatectomy specimen for a rectal cancer patient. Uh, this is a radio frequency ablation machine wherein deep seated, uh, deep -seated uh, tumors in the liver can be targeted through a needle and ablated under ultrasound guidance. So pancreas is still an organ which is uh, 
breast hole and most of the surgeons still uh, they don't want to touch this organ. So initially only a triple bypass was the treatment for pancreatic cancers. But yes, now we have an advanced laparoscopic surgeon with us. We would vouch for this that the surgical techniques have become better. We asked protocols, better stapling uh, devices, better uh, energy devices are there. So it is a little better and easier to operate these patients. And obviously not positive and advanced diseases, better chemotherapy drugs are there so that the outcomes are better. So this is a specimen of uh, pancreas, spleen, duodenum, and stomach, a vehicle surgery specimen. Again in orthopedic oncology, osteosarcoma is a dreadful disease with uh, poor survival. Young children are affected. Initially, uh, amputation was the only treatment for such patients. Now with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by limb salvage surgeries, we can give them a better function. We can save their limbs. Uh, this is one picture where the distal femur is cut here, this is the tibia and this is the specimen of a lip salvage surgery specimen. So again these techniques have improved and the functions are much better with similar and comparable oncological outcomes. So breast cancer is one, one site which has undergone a vast uh, transformation as far as surgical techniques are concerned. Initially it was a radical mastectomy where everything was removed. Uh, where it was considered as a local a local disease, so the surgeries were more radical. Now breast cancer is, is an early systemic disease, so the surgical uh, techniques have become more conservative. We have come from radical to modified radical mastectomies to breast conserving surgeries. As far as axilla is concerned, uh, there was radical lymphadenectomies. Now we have had only sentinel biopsies and uh, checking that one node in one frozen section. If that node is negative, uh, we can avoid doing the axillary lymph node dissection and thus the chances of lymphedema which was to the tune of 15% initially has come down to 1-2% to if we are doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Dr. Sir, four more Yes, just two, three slides. So, as I said, mastectomies have now transformed to breast conserving surgeries in early breast cancer. And radiotherapy, obviously, has spoken about brachytherapies and in the interstitial uh, radiation. So, the future as far as surgical techniques, minimally invasive surgeries, robotic surgeries, now even tele-surgeries are common, doctor sitting in one continent doing surgery in another continent. Better processes and implants are available. The sweep labs and rehabilitation surgeries have improved much. In medical oncology, gene therapy, target therapy, vaccines, CAR T cell therapy and much more. Radiation already has explained about different radiation techniques. So yes, oncology is an ever-evolving branch where every day some new things are happening and uh, definitely this is helping our patients to live a better life and a little longer life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swarad. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, 13 to 14 minutes for question answers, including Tulsi Sir's questions. Uh, so I would uh, start with the floor open with the questions uh, from the floor. So uh, I think any of you can answer this question. After breast conservation surgery, if, is uh, radiotherapy must in all the cases, or there are some cases where you can avoid radiotherapy? Yeah. After breast conservation surgery, radiation is uh, generally required in all the cases. There is uh, one subset uh, that if the patient is above 70 years and the uh, profile is very favorable, then in those cases we can avoid radiation. But otherwise, if the patient has undergone only breast conservation, only the tumor excision, then we have to do radiation. Then, any, I, can, I can add on one point. Yes. If patient, as he said, more than 70 years, ERPR positive, small tumor, not negative. So, there is an option of APPI, accelerated partial breast radiation, wherein the entire course of external radiation can be done in one or two days, three days. So, instead of that five weeks or six weeks of radiation, that can be compressed to three days and the patient is done with it. Now, the uh, reverse. Any case where after radical mastectomy you require radiotherapy? Yes, definitely. Load positive patients, we uh, have negative patients. And size and quadrant also makes it. Uh, so, radiotherapy where? Only to angina? No. We will give it 
when a patient has undergone the complete mastectomy, then we see the histopathology. If the tumor was large, nodes, there were a lot of nodes involved, ERPR status is negative. So these are the factors that derives the need of radiation. So these factors are present, then we give radiation. And if radiation is given, then it is given to the whole chest wall because that is the area where microscopic disease must have remained even after surgery and also to the axilla and supraclavicular area. So, yeah, internal memory in very very selected cases. So, Sundar, although it looks like a very big field, but these days even uh, in such a big field, radiation can be delivered only in three weeks. Uh, here it was five weeks. These days we deliver it in three weeks and with negligible side effects. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Kuldeep, uh, it was a nice presentation on radiotherapy. I am Dr. Amitabh Neeru Sajan and actually I would just like to put an emphasis probably you talked about uh, vestibular schwannoma. So probably we need to talk about the size and also the effect of radiation it will take effect only after probably one and a half years. And also if there is a possibility of a swelling and when there is a swelling then probably there is no other treatment other than surgery. So probably they need to understand that. Yeah, so uh, when the patients come to us with the vestibular schwannoma, then we have to see certain uh, factors uh, very minutely. One is the size of the tumor, as uh, Dr. Amitav mentioned. Another is the symptoms. So if the size is very large, a patient is very symptomatic due to the ways intracranial pressure or something like this, then we generally uh, prefer first surgery. So in that case, surgery can be done, tumor can, uh, depression, uh, decompression can be done, and after that, to the residual tumor, we can do radiation. But in other scenario, if the patient is stable, there is no symptom, tumor is small, then in that case, we can directly go to radio surgery. Uh, so this is the scenario of tumor. Another uh, part of uh, question is that, there may be a very slow uh, regression. This is true and this is very important to tell patients that when we deliver radiation, because we are not physically removing the tumor from the body. So tumor will remain there, shadow will remain there on MRI, but that shadow will be of inactive tumor cells. This is just the dead body of the tumor which is lying there. But uh, of course, the radiologist will see it for next two, three years. The tumor will regress very, very slowly. So many times it happens that patients come to us after six months, Sir, you said that our tumor is going to be finished, our MRI tumor is going to be So, it is very important to counsel the patient that this is a radio surgery, the tumor is inside you, and it will be absorbed slowly. It is not like surgery, that today we have surgery, and tomorrow we will do MRI, then we will have a place in the room. It will not be in the radiation. So we, we have to counsel this patient for this also because patients sometimes lose faith in you because they think you doctor me to me bola tha. So they have to have patients. The resting surgeon or the resting physician also have to have patients and the tumor goes uh, away in a very, very slow manner. And uh, as far as uh, post of edema is uh, uh, concerned, we these days have very good uh, steroid regimes. So we uh, prophylactically give uh, steroids. We give it steroids during the radiation treatment and we give steroids for few weeks after radiation. So uh, this uh, uh, thing of raised ICT is very necessary. Thank you, Dr. Kuldeep. Since there are many questions, I have requested both the speakers to give brief answers. Yes, sir. sir. My question is to Dr. Kuldeep Sharma. In one of the slides, you said that RT is now very cost effective. And in the same slide, you said that 25 to 30 sessions are required. So, how much is the cost? Is And is the cost is for the whole batch of 25 or is it per batch? Because 
We got need to refer the patient. The patient asks us. In, in India, it is a general practice in the uh, in most of the institutions that radiation is generally billed as a uh, complete package. So, uh, patient has to pay for the whole package and uh, it doesn't matter if I give 25 radiation or 27 radiation or 30 radiation. So, it gives you uh, a very uh, good leverage to decide according to the clinical need of the patient. And, uh, cost. Yeah, cost. It is called cost effective because when we are putting one linear accelerator, it is, it is going to work for you for the next 10 years. So it is cost effective for the institution also and that cost effectiveness is passed on to the patients also. So the whole uh, uh, treatment cost for the six weeks, it will just vary maybe from 1 lakhs to 3 lakhs, which is not very high if you compare it to the surgical costs. So it depends on what kind of uh, technology you are using. So there are different short, short answer. Sir, there is a patient, 50 years old female, having pituitary tumor and with involvement of the optic nerve leading to diplopia also. What will be the mode of treatment now? Uh, I think it's, uh, it is always uh, prudent to see a neurosurgeon first. If decompression can be done, that will be the best. And after that, if there is any residual tumor, we can give radiation to that. But if on the other side, the neurosurgeon feels that because optic nerve is already involved, so there may be damage there. So when we give radiation, we can decrease the growth potential of these excessive cells. And when the decompression happens, the growth potential decreases, the eye goes back to its normal position. Uh, this is not a very, very frequent usage of radiotherapy, but yes, I have used in uh, AIDS because, because from the Rajendra Prashad Center, we used to get a lot of cases. But in uh, routine practice, we get very, very less re get re uh, less reference. But yes, results are quite well accepted. Yes, and it is logical, but it is not with practice. Why? That's it is not so because, because, is because the refer reference are not. Maybe. So suppose this same patient who gives doctor the best, yes, they will benefit. Yes, yes. Right. In my center, I have treated three patients. I would like to add there. Yeah, doctor, 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 we can do the uh, endoscopic decompression of the orbit. So that takes away the, the prophosis part of it and therefore it becomes one better. Again, reference are the same. <laughs> Dr. H.L. Kalthus had a question. Yes. Yes. Now, interventional radiology has also come into the domain of this cancer therapy. So, one is the embolic therapy. And then there is there some radiation therapy also given through the uh, radiation technique. I want to please dilate it about this thing. Yeah, so that is called a uh, yeah. Intervention radiology, I am saying, uh, sir. In yes. Intervention radiology. Yes, sir. Yes. Suppose there is a CL mass, like they are giving embolism and that tumor size. Is there something also we can do that uh, radiation therapy through this intervention? That is my question, sir. So in that, the principle is that, that we inject certain radio pharmaceuticals, some injections of chemicals are there, which has radiation emitting potential. So we inject uh, that uh, particular agent through the vessels. So that particular agent goes to the in the neighborhood of the tumor and rays are emitted from there. So these rays are very having very low energy. So radiation goes only to the tumor area, but there is no effect on the other body parts. So this is called tear, and the embolization is through using chemotherapy agents that is called TASE. So TASE is normally done in most of the hospitals, but tear is a very very uh, cumbersome procedure, very highly technical uh, procedure. So it happens in limited hospitals. So, but yes, you are right. Uh, we can uh, inject uh, these radio pharmaceuticals and uh, we can Dr. Amish Varasan, Guru Govind Do Khade Kapi Lagu Pao. Guru Aap Ke Jo Govind Dio Mila Hai. Dr. Amil Kalashan. I was about to say that we have time for them now. Sir, I will not take much time because my 
senior friend, my colleague will be taking uh, more of the uh, journal club. So, uh, when we were students, we had uh, cobalt 60 as the only radiation. It was, I think, uh, only 2D. Is it still practiced or it is obsolete now? Sir, this is still done in few of the government hospitals, but most of the centers in India and abroad have now moved on away from it. But yes, something is better than nothing. So, few centers still practice that. Sir, proton and photon therapy, as we have now learned, that they are coming up. They are they parallel to each other. Of course, there are some plus points, minus points, cost, and other things. Yeah. What do you prefer for common Indian people? Uh, so it is. Uh, it depends on the disease, and of course, proton is one of the uh, one of the latest technique available in India and uh, in the world. But yes, there is a cost attached to it. So if uh, because many Indians are also rich, so if patient can afford and if patient scientifically require it, we are happy to refer those patients for the proton therapy. Otherwise, 98% of the patients can be just catered with photon. So the IMRT and IPRT is also applicable to protons or it is only for protons? It, it is applicable to both. Sir, my last question to my surgical friend. Sir, uh, you may not uh, feel uh, left around. Yeah. Sir, what about... Uh, uh, Cosmetic uh, reconstruction of the breast at the time of uh, MRM. How is it uh, uh, recommended at the same time, or do you want to give it time and gap? So it is also it is now recommended at the same time also. Previously we used to say that radiation will cause some contracture or disfigurement, so better you would delay it after one or two years of completing the adjuvant RT. But uh, today we are routinely doing uh, diet flaps which gives a good bulk to the breast and with better radiation techniques there is no uh, overall uh, this uh, symmetry of both the breasts. So yes, it can be done at the same setting also. Sir, all to Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kuldeep Sharma. So, uh, talking about few trends in radiation therapy at the ASTRO last month uh, at San Diego, California. Were you there, sir? Okay. So they talked about uh, flash therapy, IMRT, and artificial intelligence, which topped the list. So uh, flash therapy was uh, given the cake, but the hypofractionated therapy got the icing. Just a word on these two therapies, sir. I am glad so, that you know so much about the uh, branch which is, uh, remains under uh, you know. So anyway, uh, so flash therapy and hypofractionated therapy, actually these are those therapies in which we can deliver the dose which we earlier used to deliver in 6 weeks or 8 weeks, yeah. we can deliver those uh, thing in 1 week, 2 week and now there is a talk that we can deliver than in even a single session. But there is a downside of that that you have to be very, very cautious. You have to have a very uh, highly technical team for that. You have to have all those armamentorium with you. So it is not, it should not be like that that you are just delivering for the heck of it. So you have to be very cautious by delivering uh, these high tech uh, uh, therapies. Right. So my friend Dr. Kanda talked about the program being therapy, which is highly precise. But now the carbon ion therapy for those people who are resistant to program therapy. Just a word on the carbon ion therapy, sir. Uh, so carbon ion therapy is just the next step uh, from the protein. Resistant to proton therapy, yeah. sir. So because uh, proton, carbon ion, they all have high potential to kill cells as compared to the routine protons. So uh, of course they are talked as more effective, but uh, it is uh, very difficult to control them, to produce them and to deliver them. So there is a cost attached to it. Though proton is available in India, carbon is still to come. Yes. Okay, sir, talking about the SPRT, which is the 
is highly focused with the 4D CT scanning before treatment has become has begun. And so the you know the main this seems to be the main stay of treatment for you know early stage lung uh, cancer 1A and B. Not to forget also about the hepatobiliary carcinomas as well. So this seems to be a game changer here. Early stages. Talk us through this, sir. So because these days we are, uh, because people are more aware, tests are available, screenings are available, so we are getting more and more patients with smaller tumors. So at, and at the same time we are getting better machines. So SBRT is now very, very popular. Before 10 years back, we used to just give once in a month, but now we do SBRT regularly in everyday uh, basis. So if the tumor is small, if you have good machines, good manpower, then you can use SBRT and yes, it is the way to go. My probably last two questions to you would be regarding the PSMA, which is the prostate uh, no, uh, membrane antigen. Uh, fat imaging for prostate cancer is expected to significantly improve how you treat prostate, how you diagnose, how you how is it detected, how it's treated. Just a word on the PSMA. So yes, PSMA is one agent that is <coughs> prostate specific. So many times if you do a routine FDG PET, then prostate cancer is missed. Yeah. But it, it was seen in research that if you do PSMA PET, then the PSMA chemical has the affinity for prostate. So the sensitivity and specificity increases. So these days uh, we do not get any FDG PET for prostate cancer and we directly go for PSMA PET. What I have said was because of the phase B trial on intermediate to low risk prostate cancer and also the fast fast track to what inoperable kidney cancers. So that is a great, uh, I think, a <coughs> great question. Um, and the last point was more of a comment and which we take it very uh, gently. Uh, before, before I think, uh, just wanted to ask. Uh, yeah, before, before I answer, my last question, Doctor Amish, to you regarding the role of nervous system in cancer progression. See, this will come up big way. We probably, probably now give beta blockers to most of the patients to probably arrest the sympathetic overdrive in cancers because of the catecholamide and the cortisol strikes. So just a word on the nervous system regulation. Uh, yes, so uh, in short, I'll just give you an example beyond nervous system. There were 27 trials on metformin preventing cancer. Metformin preventing cancer. Meta-analysis says that it has no role. Similarly, there was two major concepts in last 10 years. One was beta blocker, reducing the catecholamine or the adrenergic drive. And the second was temporal chemotherapy. You give chemotherapy at 4 p.m. versus 4 a.m. in the morning and there is a difference. Still nothing has been proven. So we cannot categorically give every patient beta blocker. Yes, there is a research still going on. The moment it gets confirmed, I will come here and we'll have a CME. Thank you so much, sir. My one question, and I think that Thank question you, pertains to everyone here. Uh, me being a medical oncologist, still 90% of the patients, they come and ask me, okay, sir, robotic karai or non-robotic surgery karai? They don't, any organ, the moment they hear robotic, they want to run to robotic person. I want you to tell us once and for all in 2020 what is this robotic versus non robotic? Over robotic gives us a dexterity, a much better dexterity. The, the range of motions are very much better. Like in laparoscopy, it, is, it has a great learning curve. You have to put your hand down until the instrument will go up. In robot, if you do a round motion, the instrument will do a round motion. So the learning curve is very less. And specifically like for prostate cancer surgeries or prostate cancer open surgeries are obsolete now. The surgical MS they used to be very as prostate cancer. Now it is, it is implied that it is done very well because that narrow space can be approached 
better by a robotic system only. Similarly, if you talk about transoral robotic surgeries for base skull or tonsil, again it is a narrow space which can never be entered unless you do it by robotic. You cannot do an open base tongue resection for orally. You have to split the tongue and do a protest procedure, mandible splitting, so that is very morbid. So these two are the sites, neck or the pharynx, vocal cord, laryngeal region or the prostate, where the surgery cannot be done by any other uh, uh, modality except the robotic. So uh, is there a survival advantage proven? Uh, why I am telling you asking this question, not every hospital and not every OT has a robotic surgical arm. Is there a survival advantage difference in prostate and in uh, uh, NNN if you do robotic versus non-robotic? Yeah, that's what I am telling. These two sites you cannot do a non-robotic oncological surgery. Is there a survival advantage? No. Survival difference, the trials are head to head with chemotherapy versus surgical approach. There is no open based on resection versus robotic based on resection or an open prostate versus a robotic prostate. Because these are two different surgeries and they definitely the outcomes, there may, might not be a survival advantage, but the nerve preservation rates, the functional outcomes, the urine capacity and for laryngeal, the edema, so that is much better in robotic. You cannot compare an open versus robotic in do these two uh, sub specifically. Yeah.